Welcome to Bayside Church Online. It's such an honor and privilege to connect with you again this week. We'd also love to hear from you and have you engage with us. And you can do so via Facebook Live or YouTube. You can comment, you can have conversations together. And to help you get started with those conversations, here's one question. Which worship song has been on your playlist this week? We'd love to hear that. Also, we'd love to see wherever you are. Um, we'd like to see how you watch and engage with us. So you can take a picture, a snapshot of you and your family or your friends, or if you're just by yourself, that's fine. Take a picture, show us how you watch Bayside Online. Post it on social and tag Bayside Church. Now, we are in for an awesome service together and it's awesome to start worshiping God. So I would really like to encourage you, wherever you are, to just sing from the top of your lungs, worship God in this situation and exalt His name. Let's go to worship. Free. 
isn't it great to spend time in God's presence and feel refreshed and feel re-strengthened? I don't know about you, but that's how I always feel when I worship God. And thanks, team, for bringing us in that space today. Now we continue this time with giving our tithes and offerings. And I really want to encourage you all to contribute to our church and its mission. And you can do so via PushPay, the website online giving button, or the app. As I mentioned, you can contribute to our church and its mission. God is on a mission in this world. He wants to see people reconnect with Him, touched by Him, transformed by Him. And as Bayside Church, we are called for such a time as this to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to live out His mission. And we have an awesome mission statement that says exactly that. That we are to be a Christian community who work together in justice, mercy, and faith. Despite that we're all separate in our own homes, we can't meet together face to face. We can still be a community who uphold each other, who connect together, and who have one heart and one voice. And we can work together. We can serve together. We can encourage people that need encouragement. We can pray for one another. We can lift each other up before God's throne. And we can also contribute together. We can give so that the church can continue this awesome mission. So that together we will see God's justice, mercy and faith shine all around the Bayside area, all around our city and all around our nation. So please be a Christian community who work together who contribute together in justice, mercy, and faith. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. You are an awesome Father. You're a good Father. Lord, and you are an awesome and fantastic God. And we love you so much. Thank you, Lord, that you, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of heaven and earth are still in control. No matter what we see happening around us, no matter what times we're in, the circumstances, you are still in control. And you are still on a mission. You still want to see hearts reconciled to you, transformed by you, empowered by you. You still want to see people find healing and restoration. And you still want to build your community, your kingdom of people who work together in justice, mercy, and faith. And Father, I pray for every person here today, Lord, that they will receive your blessing, your touch, that they will know that they are connected to your community, that they will know that you are with them through your Holy Spirit and that in your spirit we are all together in it and that all together we can serve together, work together for your mission, for your kingdom to come here in the Bayside area, in this city, in this nation. Lord, bless everyone that's contributing today and bless everyone who needs a special touch from you today too. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for your contribution today. Now we're in for a treat. We have Pastor Rob share an amazing message. So let's all listen to that. Over to you, Rob. Thanks so much, Josh. I believe Young Adults is going well. Um, all our young adults meeting online, as many of our connect groups are doing now on Zoom, which is wonderful. And I want to continue with you the series that I've been doing for the last few weeks called Becoming Like Jesus. This is part seven. Might be the last part, might do one more. We'll see how we go. If you're taking your own notes, the title of the message is Great Expectations. And uh, you can find message notes online or on our Bayside Church Melbourne app. Just click on the media button and you can bring up the weekly notes. You'll also find some discussion questions on there as well. So great expectations. And of course, this is Palm Sunday weekend. And uh, I thought I would uh, do a show and tell. We actually have um, a live palm branch right here. I bought this from home. I actually cut it off, uh, a Kentia palm. And uh, this is what they were doing on the first 
Palm Sunday or whatever day it happened to be in the Jewish calendar. They're all waving these palm branches uh, before Jesus and then laying them down on the road to have this beautiful carpet, um, which is uh, talked about in prophecy as well in Isaiah 55, 12. You can go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands. So obviously they were palm trees, right? So let's have a collective groan. I actually missed the groaning. I don't hear any groaning when we're doing a uh, live stream, but we can have a collective groan together right now on the count of three. One, two, three. Oh, that's good. We can hear that all around Bayside, Melbourne and beyond. Palm Sunday commemorates Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and it's mentioned in all four Gospels. And so this is a really important story, and I want to unpack what was happening and, uh, more importantly, what this means to us today. And so we're going to read in Matthew 21. We're going to read Matthew's account, and then a little bit later we're going to read some of John's account of this story as well. So Matthew 21 verses 1 to 11, if you'd like to follow this in your Bibles. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from trees, as I demonstrated a moment ago, and then spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Amazing story. You can just see the scene as we read those words. Let me set a bit of background for you uh, to this event. This happened five days before Jesus was crucified. Uh, Lazarus had just been raised from the dead just a few days before. The day before this event, Jesus had a celebratory meal with Lazarus and his sisters, Martha and Mary. You probably know that story quite well. And so you can imagine them celebrating. Lazarus had been dead. He was uh, brought back to life by Jesus. And so Mary and Martha put on this, this lovely meal to celebrate the return of Lazarus. Jesus is there, the disciples. Martha's slaving away in the kitchen. Mary's not helping. She's sitting there listening to Jesus. And uh, Jesus, just to set the scene for that story a little bit, this is five days before Jesus is crucified. And so you can imagine, you know, this is really, really important here. Jesus is talking about his last words and Mary wants to sit and listen to what Jesus has to say. Sometime during that meal, another Mary comes in with some ointment and uh, pours it on Jesus. She cries over his feet, wetting them with her tears drying his feet with her hair. And uh, that story is recorded in all of the Gospels as well. An incredible story, anointing Jesus for his upcoming burial. At this time, Jesus' popularity is at an all-time high and the religious leaders hate Jesus more than ever. They're jealous of his popularity and they're also trying to kill Lazarus. So I just want to pause for a moment and stop and think about this because can you imagine how Lazarus would be feeling? Uh, we don't know what he died of, but maybe he was sick for a long period of time. He finally succumbed to his sickness and he died. He's uh, laid in a grave and four days later, Jesus turns up and calls Lazarus to come out of the grave. And this guy comes out, 
still in his grave clothes. He's loosed from the clothes by his disciples. He's really happy to be back with his family, back with Jesus, back with his friends. They're having a meal together. And then Lazarus hears they're trying to kill him again. So this is not a great week for Lazarus. Everything that could go wrong is going wrong. A little bit like the season that we're living in at the moment. You know, we had enough with the bushfires late last year, earlier this year, and then some floods. And now we've got this COVID-19 and people are restricted in movements. Businesses are closing, all sorts of stuff going on. This is a tough time. But, you know, we can read the events of this story from the comfort of history. We look back through the tunnel of time, 2,000 years, and we see that everything turned out fine, in fact, more than fine, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so right now we're stuck in the middle of this difficult season. There will come a time when we look back on this and go, well, we actually got through this okay. We're going to get through this okay. Let's focus on some of the elements of this story for a few minutes. The donkey and the colt. Jesus says to his disciples, go into the village ahead of you, And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This kind of reminds me a bit of when the police commandeer a car. You know, I don't know if this has ever happened to you. It's never happened to me in real life. But I've seen it plenty of times on TV where uh, the, the police man, woman comes along and you know, stop, hand me the car, sir, madam, thank you. And the police person gets in and drives off in the car and the owner of the car is kind of just left standing there. It's a little bit like that here. Jesus commandeers a donkey uh, and his colt. And it's fascinating that Jesus says, if anyone asks you, just say the Lord needs it. And uh, Jesus, as Lord, has the right to whatever his followers own, And so whoever owned this donkey and this colt said, oh, the Lord needs it, that's fine. We need to have that attitude in life as well, my brothers and sisters. Everything that we have belongs to him. When I gave my life to Jesus, I gave my life to Jesus. Everything I am, everything I have, he is the Lord of my life and, and everything belongs to him. If he wants to commandeer something, then that's fine. And uh, I don't want to hang on to it if he's commandeered it. Amen. So let's have a look at this cult for a moment. Uh, First of all, the cult was borrowed, but then it was returned. In uh, Mark 11, 3, if anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. So Jesus only commandeered this cult for a period of time. Uh, He gave it back Later, as I said before, Jesus as Lord has the right to whatever we own. Uh, sometimes he'll ask us to give something. Sometimes he'll ask us to lend it uh, with, the, with the benefit of having it returned. Either way, we don't lose. Sometimes we view giving as losing. Like if I give $20 to someone, I no longer have the 20 But in the kingdom of God uh, finances... Giving is not losing, giving is gaining. In fact, whenever we invest, and numerous times in the New Testament, it talks about when we give to the Lord and give to the Lord's work, we store up for ourselves treasure for eternity. Uh, So giving is not losing. And of course, lending is not losing either because at some point we get it back. There's a fascinating proverb in uh, the book of Proverbs 1917 that talks about this. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and he will reward them for what they have done. Isn't that amazing? Every time we're kind to someone who's poor, who's struggling, who's doing it tough, especially at this period of time that we're going through now, if you find someone who's, who's doing life tough and you have the wherewithal to help them and you help them, the Bible says that you're lending to the Lord. Amazing truth. And he will reward you for what you have done. As a church community, we have refocused ourselves during this time on pastoral care and helping people um, through this difficult season. Second thing about the cult is that it had never been ridden. Luke 19.30 tells us that. 
Go to the village ahead of you. As you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. It's a very important principle here. It's kind of a first fruits uh, offering. No one has ever ridden this colt before. It was ready to be ridden for the first time by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And uh, the last thing about the cult that I just want to highlight to you here is that this was a statement of Jesus' humility. Officials would ride donkeys. So government officials or civic leaders, civil leaders would ride donkeys, but Jesus rode on a donkey's colt or a donkey's foal. A military procession would use horses and chariots, but donkeys were used for civil, not military processions. I'm going to comment a bit, a bit more about this in a few minutes' time. Uh, the people had these great expectations, which is why I've called the message by that title, Great Expectations. But Jesus, even here, by not riding the donkey, not riding a horse, not coming in a chariot, was actually making a statement of humility. He was saying, I've not come as a political leader. I've not come as a military leader. My coming has a completely different purpose. And so I'm going to outline that a little bit more in a few minutes' time. Let's just read a few verses from John's account of this amazing story of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. John chapter 12, I'm going to pick it up at verse 9. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. So Lazarus had become a bit of a spectacle. We'd all heard about Lazarus. Everyone knew Lazarus. They'd heard that he was dead, that he had come back to life, that Jesus was the reason for him still being alive, and they all wanted to check him out. So we want to see Jesus. We want to see Lazarus as well. Go down to verse 17. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. And wouldn't it have been good if they'd just woken up to themselves right there? Let me get back uh, to the expectation of the people during this time. So as I said before, this is five days before the Passover. The Jewish feast of Passover celebrated God's triumphal deliverance of the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt. And so the crowd's expectation, because of Bible prophecy, they knew that another deliverer was coming. Uh, Quite often this deliverer is compared to Moses. As Moses led the people out of slavery and the oppression of Egypt, the people of Israel in Jesus' day and age were looking forward to the fulfillment of the prophetic word that said, one day, Israel, your deliverer is going to come and he's going to set you free from oppression. And they're thinking, Jesus is the Messiah. He's the promised deliverer of God. He's going to set us free from oppression to the Roman rulers. And he's going to then bring deliverance to Israel and usher in the kingdom of God. And so these people had great expectations. They were looking for someone else. They were looking for another Moses. And so they should have got the picture when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the cult. He's not a political leader. He's not a military leader. He's coming in a different way for a different purpose. But the people are paying royal homage to Jesus. They're recognizing him as a king. They're doing to Jesus what they would have done to a monarch, spreading their garments waving and spreading palm branches over the road in front of Jesus. They're expecting him to set them free. And all the while they're singing or shouting Psalm 118 verses 25 to 27. This is part of what's known as the great halal. It's uh, the uh, hymn book of praise that was used particularly around Passover, Psalms 111 to 118. 
And so they're crying this out from the Psalms. Hosanna, Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God and he has made his light shine on us with boughs in hands, with those palm branches, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. And so they're calling out Hosanna. Some of the songs we're singing about Hosanna means save now or, or save I beg you, which really needs to be said with a South African accent, right? Save or beg you, save now. They're trying to force Jesus into a place where he would set them free now from Roman rule and oppression. But Jesus had already taught the people that his kingdom was not of this world. Salvation at this time was not to be with military might or political power or geographical location. Salvation was to be internal, freedom from the inside out. Do you remember the words that Jesus quoted as he started his ministry? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's called me, he's anointed me, empowered me to bring good news to the poor, to set the prisoners free and uh, uh, sight for the blind, to proclaim the year of the Lord's freedom or, or liberty. Jesus did not come to bring freedom from Roman rule, but he came to bring freedom, not just to the people of Israel, but to all people of all time from the things that separate us from God. And before I wrap this up, let me just focus on three or four of these. The first thing that separates us from God is legalism. That's an emphasis on ritual without a true relationship with God. If you cast your mind back a few weeks ago, I shared a message with you called Jesus Heartbeat. Uh, in that message, we looked at the Imago Day of Jesus. The image of God that he portrayed was one of compassion. He said, be compassionate because that's what your father is like. God is compassionate, be compassionate like him. The Imago Day of the religious uh, leaders of the day was not compassion, but it was holiness. It was all about purity, washing hands, although, you know, hand washing is particularly important at the moment. But it was all about purifying and particularly external purity in order to be pure enough for God. Well, Jesus came and he blew that legalism away. He said, no, 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 purity is all well and good, but he said, be compassionate, act in a compassionate way. That's the way Jesus' heart beat. And so Jesus came to deliver us from legalism. Tied into that, he came to deliver from the law. Galatians 3, 24, 25, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we no longer are under the tutor. Uh, our eldest daughter, Gigi, had a tutor for a little while when she was at school. Um, I passed on to my kids uh, my uh, really poor ability for mathematics. I wasn't ever great at maths. I'm very grateful for calculators. And so I passed on that trait to my kids. And so Gigi, at one point, we got her a tutor to help her with her maths. A tutor comes in to, to lead you from where you're at to where you need to be. And when you arrive at where you need to be, the tutor leaves. You don't need them anymore because you've arrived. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying about the law. Not that the law is bad, not that we should live lawless lives, but the law, the Old Testament law, was like a tutor that would bring us to Jesus Christ. And then when we had found Jesus, the law departs. And so there's one law now, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And the, the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And all of the Old Testament is summarized in that. We've been set free from all of these individual uh, legalistic laws to a point now where we love God and love others and that summarizes the entire Old Testament. What a beautiful freedom that we have in Jesus. The third thing that Jesus came to set us free from was Satan. In Colossians 2, 15, having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. 
It's interesting that the, Paul, uh, that the Apostle Paul would use the word triumph here. He's referring to a Roman triumph when they would lead a procession. So the, the military rulers would come first and then the army and uh, all the people of the city would be both sides of this procession. And at the end of the procession would come all of the people who were from the defeated armies, the defeated peoples, often in shackles and chains, uh, humiliated, and people would throw uh, rotten vegetables and eggs and stuff like that at these people as they went past. This was known as a triumph when uh, the people would celebrate that a particular land had been conquered and made part of the empire. And Paul says that's what Jesus did. On the cross, he had a triumph. He defeated death. He defeated the devil. He defeated all of the demons. And he rendered them powerless and uh, he, he triumphed over them. And so, you know, some Christians have a very big devil. They're always talking about the devil. The devil did this and the devil did that. I'm going to tell you, the picture in Scripture of the devil is uh, one who has been defeated and it's like he's in this, this procession now and he's going along like this with his head down and, and people are just making fun of him. And so he has, Jesus has set us free from Satan. He set us free from sin. Luke 19, 42, Jesus said, If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace. This is after the triumphal procession and Jesus is sitting on a hill looking over Jerusalem and crying over the city. He said, if you only knew what would bring you peace, I've come to bring you peace. I've come to set you free from that which holds you captive, that which is on the inside of you, your own sin. And then finally, Jesus came to set us free from death. John 5, 24, very truly I tell you, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. I often comfort myself with that, you know. I mean, as life goes on, you know that you're closer to death than you were to, are to birth. Uh, times like this with COVID-19 and we're seeing, you know, people all around the world, uh, thousands of people uh, who have died from this and people will continue to die from this and, and other conditions. And a lot of people fear death because death is the great unknown. But in Jesus Christ, we have a friend who has experienced death. He's been there and done that. It's like if you went to a foreign country, which I'm aware is something we can't do at the moment, but when you go to a foreign country and you're on your own, then you are kind of not really sure where to go and what to do. But if you have a friend there or a family member who lives there or has been there before and, and they can take you to all the amazing places, it, 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 it will revolutionize that trip. And that's what Jesus is like. He died. He's experienced death. He knows what it's like. He came back from the dead. He's conquered it. And so in Jesus Christ, we have a friend who's been there and done that. Isn't that wonderful? Comfort yourselves and comfort one another with those words. And so freedom from all those things, legalism, law, Satan, sin, and death. And if the Son has set you free, you shall be free indeed. Many in Israel missed the Messiah because he came in an unlikely way with an unexpected message. Some people today miss the Messiah as well because Jesus is not what they're expecting. They have great expectations, but their expectations are misguided. Some people are looking for a Messiah who will deliver from all suffering. Others for a Messiah who will immediately meet every need. Some are looking for a Messiah who backs a particular political party. Others are looking for a Messiah who supports my opinion as opposed to everybody else's. And some support us uh, looking for a Messiah who has nothing to do with certain kinds of people. I'm going to tell you, church, that if we're looking to Jesus to be all of these things, our great expectations will be sorely dashed. Let's make sure that our expectations of Jesus are firmly planted in the Word of God. He is the one who has come to forgive and to set free every single person. 
that will humble themselves and come to him. Let's pray together, shall we? And, and first of all, I'm going to say a prayer for anyone who would like to commit their lives to Jesus Christ. We had a couple of people last weekend, or a couple of weekends ago, I should say, um, who indicated via our website that they wanted to make Jesus their Lord and Savior. So maybe some of you, you want to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life to experience all the things that I've explained in this message. I'm going to say a prayer nice and slowly, and I want you to repeat this prayer wherever you are. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus. I believe that Jesus died on a cross and rose again from the dead. That in Jesus, the law and legalism and sin and death are defeated. I thank you, Lord. Come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean and fill me with your spirit. From this day forward, I will live for you and serve you in your name. Amen. And Heavenly Father, I just pray right now for anyone who said that prayer for the first time, for others who might not be ready to pray that prayer yet, but are engaging with us and want to find out more. I pray, Lord God, that you will make yourself real to every person. May they experience your presence. May they experience your peace. May they experience hope, particularly in the challenging times <clears throat> that we're being faced with at the moment. I pray for every person that's part of Bayside Church and everyone that's engaging with us online in this season, Father God, and I speak your blessing and peace and presence and your provision for every single one in Jesus' mighty name. Everyone said, Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you. We'd love to um, hear from you if you've just made a decision to uh, make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior then we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to hear from you as well. If you'd like to be a part of an online connect group or if we can offer you pastoral care in some way, then please uh, email connect at baysidechurch.com.au and one of our pastoral team will respond to you. God bless you, church. I'll see you next weekend for Good Friday and for Easter Sunday.
awesome has this service been? I hope you feel encouraged and lifted up for this week ahead. And talking about encouragement, how about encouraging someone else, looking out for someone else? Share a funny story or a funny meme. Bring a smile to someone's face. We may not see each other face to face, but we can still be connected. Also, if you want to be connected with us as a church, if you have a need, if you need prayer, if you need pastoral care, please contact us via connect at baysidechurch.com.au or you can ring us on the pastoral care phone line. We are happy to pray with you and to guide you through this journey in these days. Also, please stay connected with Bayside Church via social media. Follow us on Instagram or like us on Facebook. We'd love to connect with you. For now, have a great week. God bless you and see you next time. Bye-bye.